The wind howls across the plains, snow whipping sideways, stinging the face. You and I, we know that kind of cold, the kind that eats through gloves, the kind that makes a fire burn down faster than you can stack wood. Back in the day when there was no backup propane, no chainsaw, no quick trip to the store, families still had to make it through. Hard winners test hard men and harder families. In 1832, George Catlin, an American painter riding with the Lakota, watched them ride out a blizzard, days of snow, weeks even, and still inside their typees he found warmth. He wrote with surprise. They were living comfortable while outside the storm raged, not freezing, not desperate, warm, because a teepee wasn't just a tent. It was survival technology, a shelter built for storms and smarter than it looked. Out on the Great Plains, winter didn't play games. The snow came hard, the wind cut deep, and firewood vanished. Lewis and Clark wrote about it back in 1804 when they stayed with the Mandan. They watched families ration tiny piles of wood scraping by when the drifts swallowed everything else. They knew what we all know. Once the wood pile's gone, the cold comes hunting. You felt it. When the fire dies down at two in the morning and the frost creeps in, when you wake and your breath hangs heavy and the canvas roof drips with ice. Back then, no backup propane, no chainsaw, no quick drive to town, just men, women, and children staring into the white, knowing the storm would last for days. So, here's the question. When the fuel was gone, when the snow buried every log, how did they keep warm? Now, here's the genius part. The tippy wasn't just some cone of sticks and hide. It was an engineering marvel born from centuries of trial and error tested in winters far harder than most of us will ever know. The Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Blackfoot tribes who lived their whole lives under open skies built typees that stood 12 to 20 feet tall. Archaeologists, ethnographers, even early frontiersmen recorded it. Tall enough for a fire, wide enough for a family, shaped like a cone so the wind didn't tear it apart but slid right over. Think about that. A perfect snow-shedding roof made before a man ever built a cabin out here. And the cover, not just canvas, not back in the day. We're talking buffalo hide, thick, heavy as winter itself. Peter Iverson wrote in the Plains Indians of the 20th century that those hides sometimes doubled up, stopped the wind cold, snow piled outside, but inside, the air stayed still. The hide acted like nature's insulation system. It trapped heat the way earth traps spring water. Quiet, steady. You felt the opposite. You've sat in a nylon tent with the wind hammering all night, and every gust steals your warmth. A teepee was the reverse. The harder the storm pushed, the tighter the hide pressed against the frame. The tighter it pressed, the less heat slipped away. Smart design. Simple. No moving parts. Just poles, hide, and wisdom. And remember, this wasn't built for a weekend trip. This was home. Families raised kids in here. They cooked. They sewed. They prayed. Back in the day, when winters could run six months long, the teepee was their furnace, their fortress, their comfort, not roaring flames, not endless stacks of wood, just shape hide and survival smarts. That's the payoff. The teepee wasn't just shelter, it was a natural insulation system born from the land itself. The kind of design you and I can still learn from if we're willing to listen to the old ways. Here's the trick. They didn't build a bonfire inside the teepee. They didn't waste wood like that. A roaring blaze would eat through the woodpile in a single night and smoke you out besides. Instead, they built a small steady fire, just enough flame to light the lodge to heat a few stones to keep the air alive. Reginald Laubin in his book, The Indian Teepee, wrote how the Lakota tended coals in the center, never a tower of flame, always a bed of embers, and those embers had a purpose. They heated stones, stones that glowed red heavy with stored heat. At night, the stones were pulled from the fire, wrapped in hide, sometimes covered in clay, and set near the sleepers. Those stones gave off warmth for hours. Long after the flames died, the stones still whispered heat. Not roaring flames, but glowing stones were the real furnace. You know that feeling. 
Camping in winter when the fire shrinks to ash and the cold pushes in. You've wished for one more log. They didn't wish. They planned. They turned rocks into batteries. Back in the day, before anyone said the word thermal, they knew it in their bones. Hard winters test hard men, and smart men make the most of little fire. But it wasn't just the stones. Inside the tippy, every layer counted. Families slept under buffalo robes, each hide thick as three wool blankets. Traders in the 1800s wrote about it, calling those robes worth more than gold when the mercury dropped. Heavy, yes, but warm enough to keep frost from the bones. Dogs curled close, children huddled in circles. Every body a heat source, every robe a wall against the cold. Think about it, the wood pile's gone, the blizzard howls. But inside, a tiny fire, a circle of glowing stones. Buffalo hides heavy as winter itself, and a family pressed close. That's not just survival, that's strategy. That's wisdom, the kind we do well to remember next time our propane tank runs low or the chainsaw won't start at two in the morning. Now here's another piece of genius. A fire inside a closed space is a blessing and a curse. Too much smoke and you choke. Too much draft and you freeze. Back in the day when there was no chimney pipe, no cast iron stove, the tribes had to solve that puzzle. And they did. On top of every tippy, there were two flaps of buffalo hide, adjustable. Move them with a pole, angle them to the wind, and you could let smoke drift out while the heat stayed in. Reginald Laubin described it in the Indian teepee. George Catlin painted it in the 1830s, the twin flaps pointing like wings, catching or releasing the wind as needed. That wasn't decoration, that was control. Think of it like the damper on a wood stove. You've used one, you turn it, you cut down the draft, you keep the coals alive. Same principle, except this was made of hide and poles, simple as can be. A manual thermostat built long before iron ever came to the plains. Adjust the flaps right, and the tippy breathed. Not too much, not too little, just right. You felt the opposite. In a canvas tent, smoke curling in your eyes, coughing till you can't sleep. Or worse, cold wind ripping through every seam because you open too much. The plains people knew better. They fine-tuned airflow with nothing but instinct and wood poles. No backup propane, no chainsaw, no stove damper, just leather wings on top of a cone working like nature's own switch. And here's the payoff. The tippy didn't just keep you dry. It managed fire and air with elegance. A thermostat handmade centuries before we gave the thing a name. That's wisdom carved out of survival, the kind we forget, until the power goes out and the storm rattles our own windows. Inside the tippy survival was never left to chance. James R. Walker, a doctor who lived among the Lakota in the late 1800s, wrote about how families arranged themselves for warmth. They didn't sprawl apart like we do in a big house. No. They circled together, heads toward the fire, bodies close, everyone part of the system. On the ground they laid buffalo hides, layer after layer, thick, heavy, soft. But more important, they blocked the killing cold that rose up from frozen earth. If you've ever camped on snow with just a nylon pad, you know the chill creeping through your spine. Back in the day, they solved it with hides thick as a mattress. Simple, effective. And on top, buffalo robes. Traders in the 18th and 19th centuries wrote about them, said a single robe was equal to three or four European wool blankets. Picture that. One hide heavy as winter itself, keeping frost off your bones. Families stacked those robes high. Parents wrapped children in them tight as cocoons. Dogs curled into the circle too, adding their warmth to the mix. Every layer mattered. Every body was fuel for the night. You've seen the other side. A night in a canvas tent, shivering, because you thought one sleeping bag was enough. Or, that time the fire burned out at 2 a.m. and you woke with ice in your mustache. They didn't let it come to that. They built warmth into their way of life. Not just with fire. With community. With planning. So imagine the blizzard outside howling against the plains. The wood pile's gone. The wind is merciless, but inside, a circle of people hides beneath robes above dogs pressed close. 
The fire, low, the stone, still warm. And the storm can rage all at once. Because survival isn't only about fire, it's about family and design and wisdom passed down. Not just flame, but community. Not just heat, but cleverness. That's the truth of the teepee. It wasn't just a shelter. It was a living system where every piece, every person worked together to keep the cold at bay. So what do we take from this? The Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Mandan. They all knew something we forget too easily today. Survival wasn't about throwing more wood on the fire. It was about using what little you had smarter. They practiced fuel management. Keep the fire small. Feed it steady. Make every stick count. We know the opposite. You've been there tossing log after log only to wake up at 3 a.m. with nothing left but ash. Back in the day, they couldn't afford that mistake, and they didn't make it. They understood thermal mass. Rocks, earth hides, heat stored, released, slow and steady. You and I call it common sense. They lived it. The Jesuit missionaries wrote about it. Laubin documented it. Even Catlin in the 1830s shook his head at how comfortable a Lakota camp could be when the prairie stormed outside. They relied on insulation and community more than firewood. Buffalo hides thick as three blankets. Families circled close, each body adding warmth. Dogs pressed in too. The teepee was more than shelter. It was a living system, a design tuned to the land, tuned to the people. And it worked. That's the real takeaway. You don't always beat the cold with bigger flames. Sometimes you beat it with smarter design, with a circle of family, with hides and stones, with old wisdom, not roaring fires, not endless wood, just what you need used the right way. The plains people didn't just survive their blizzards. They turned canvas and hide into fortresses of warmth. And that's something worth remembering. Next time the wind rattles your windows or the power cuts out and you're staring at a dark, cold night. The people of the plains didn't just survive the storm. They turned their lodges into warm fortresses. So here's where I turn it over to you. Out there in the cold, when the fire burns low, when the night stretches long, have you ever tried it? Sleeping through a winter night with nothing but a small fire, a few glowing stones, maybe a heavy blanket, bushcrafters, old hands, weekend campers share your story. Did it work? Or did the cold find its way in? Because back in the day, the people of the plains didn't wonder. They knew. They trusted their design, their hides, their family circle. No backup propane, no chainsaw, no modern sleeping bag. Just the wisdom that kept them alive when hard winters tested hard men. If you've got a tale, drop it in the comments. We've all been there waking up at 2 a.m. stoking the coals trying to hold back the frost. I want to hear how you managed it. Maybe you've got a trick worth passing on. Maybe you've got a story worth telling around this same fire. And if you want more of these survival hacks drawn straight from history, stick around. Hit that subscribe. Because the old ways still have plenty to teach us. The plains people turned hides and poles into fortresses of warmth. And if we listen close, we can too.